Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. How's the temperature today, Evan? Good. Good? I'll let you know as I get sweatier and sweatier. You should know that I opened the window behind you for exactly like 85 seconds earlier just to cool it down. I was like, shit, it's half a degree too warm in here. We need to get this down otherwise. I showered right before I came, so maybe that was a mistake. Well, that's another variable I can't account for, man. Yeah, I didn't think about the, the warmth of the room. Can't keep up with this guy. After on, honestly only wanting red Smarties on Tuesdays and green on every other day, I thought I, that's going to be the last of your requests. But here we are. Meanwhile, Brad, unproblematic as always. This is the first time you've actually ever been described as unproblematic. Yes. A thorn is what you usually are. <laughs> Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast, folks. Uh, I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna, and we are excited to talk to you about Red Wings hockey today. I sure am excited for the comments afterwards. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. Evan, who's the only one who reads the comments anymore. You dive into YouTube sometimes just to see what's... Uh... Occasionally. Yeah. I give, I give the video my view, and then that's that's what I that's my my process in the morning. That's your contribution to the show. Very much so. How much do you watch of the video? I hit start and then hit stop. <laughs> Have you page ever... loads? I stop it and then I read the comments. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever accidentally like let a podcast run in the background? Oh no, you can't stand it. <laughs> No, I would never let that happen. It's not the sound of your own voice, though, of course, because you don't... Mostly that, yeah. You just hate mine and Brad's voices. Uh, I, all of that statement is correct, basically. <laughs> I hate hearing myself, and I hate hearing both of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I told these guys not to make me laugh, because I'm still like a, susceptible to coughing right now. It's off to a bad start. Good thing Brad is completely unfunny, so I'm just going to look to the left the whole show. Uh, on today's episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we are, of course, going to be talking about Detroit's game last night against the San Jose Sharks. Plenty happened. Um, everything from scratched players to uh, an ejection to six Red Wings goals, which it ties their season high, something like that. Or is their third time scoring? It ties at uh, Chicago and opening night against Tampa. That's right. Yeah. So uh, fun game, actually. And we'll be chatting a little bit about stuff that happened around the NHL and making it to overtime and seeing where that takes us. I just thought of a fun game we could have played on this episode if mm. I was prepared for it. I would just read off a series of random names and you try and guess which ones are actually San Jose Sharks. <laughs> Who was that one player that was definitely just a fake player put out by the Sharks? Hob Gwoks. Yeah, that's not real. That's no. a name. Did you know that? That sounds like one of those names you... So sometimes we try to get the guy who runs our runs golf at Whistle Bear will put in fake names so that he calls them out as like the long drive or like closer to the pin. That is what that name sounds like. <laughs> no, that is someone who's playing Scrabble and early on in the game accidentally knocked the board over and those were just the tiles that fell on the floor. So I just pulled up his player page and at f he's number 89, but at first I saw 99. I'm like, this is an NHL creative player. <laughs> like, that's fake. His first name's Jaden. All together normal, common enough. Hobgwox. It's like Tom Wamsgans from, uh, what's it called? I think three separate people Succession. tweeted at me that that is definitely a Harry Potter character. It is. That's actually a creature from Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. The yeah. books, not the movies. The movies are an abomination. I won't hear anything otherwise. Yeah, and then uh, Max tweeted out one of the shark skulls, and I just read it. I'm like, that is the most generic name I've ever heard, so that is all so fake. Man, the sharks. They're... Somehow above 500, which shocked me. Mark Edward Velasic was a healthy scratch last night. Well, how old is he now? Old, and he's still got like three years left on his contract after this one at a lot of money. Good for him. Yeah, honestly, good for him. Good for Carlson, good for Burns. Just make that money. Why not? Make that money, live in California, do your thing. That really is the dream, isn't it? Honestly, <laughs> just cash out, grow out the flow. Show up like once every eight Back games nine of your is. career, you can kind of just put it in autopilot if you want. That is the dream. Carlson's been doing a bit better this year. Oh, know? yeah. Yeah. For him, it was just a matter of getting healthier. Like, he's still playing on half an ankle. Those don't tend to grow back. No. No. Uh, anyhow, 
Before we get into all that, uh, I do want to talk to everyone about the Jamie Daniels Foundation. Uh, we're very, very proud to support them. Uh, it's a foundation that was established in memory of Jamie Daniels. Uh, and it was established by Jamie's father and Red Wings lead announcer, Ken Daniels, and Jamie's mother, Lisa Daniels Goldman. And for those of you who don't know, uh, we have actually started a campaign. We started it at the beginning of the season called Wings Money on the Board, and it benefits the Jamie Daniels Foundation. So if you go to wingedwheelpodcast.com slash blog, you'll see a post there about Wings Money on the Board, how to contribute. You basically make pledges based on things that happen uh, about the Red Wings all season. So how many more at cider hits, how many Lucas Raymond goals, you know, $2 per goal or, or 50 cents per hit or whatever it might be. And at the end of the season, uh, you make that contribution. And then also we're giving away a ton of great prizes. Um, and there's special one-off games too. So in addition to the season long pledges, we'll announce, Hey, this game on February 31st is a special game. Make your pledge for that game. And we'll have prizes like We've given away a signed Nemesnikov jersey. Prashanth Iyer, who we've started this with, has given away like a Raymond and a Cider jersey. It's a lot of good fun. It goes to a great cause. Check that out, wingedwheelpodcast.com slash blog, and go from there. All right. The Detroit Red Wings ended up taking out the San Jose Sharks in a 6-2 game where, for the most part, they were completely dominant in my mind. That was one of the best games that that was that bounce back game. You said it last episode, Brad. If you ever need a bounce back game, a tune up against the Sharks is a really good opportunity, and they took it. They, it took them a, a bit to get warmed up during that game. After very, it was the opposite of last game. It was a very uninspired start, mm -hmm. and then got much much better. It, one of the times because nothing really happened till that fluky Bertuzzi goal, mm -hmm. and that just seemed to like get the ball rolling, and they never looked back. Yeah, the second time in two games where Bertuzzi opened the scoring with a goal that just kind of went in. Yeah, that was one of the worst goals I've seen in the NHL this year. No, totally intentional. He knew what he was doing. Absolutely he cool backhand. Looking at the net. He doesn't need to. He's just that cool. <laughs> Man, Bert, when he's pissed off, might be one of the scariest players in the league. Not because he's like the biggest or the strongest, but it looks like his eyes look like he's about to take his the blade off his skates and, and stab you with it. Like he looks like he will go through no at like find no end to kill you on the ice if he's mad at you. Bertuzzi open scoring, um, but the highlight of the first period, for better or for worse, was Giovanni Smith's battle with Jacob Middleton. Um, I'm gonna see each four. Man, that West McCauley goal. <laughs> that was the highlight of the first period. I love that so much. He know he and the way he delivers it too is like you don't really know it's coming, and then he just. He hits you with a one, two, five minutes each for fighting. It's fine. The crowd gets amped up about it, too. Love it's it. like that's how bare bones hockey is. Like the bar is on the floor for the <laughs> NHL. That's how involved the refs should make themselves into the, the narrative of the game. Yeah, that's about it. Just say something cool on the mic. Actually, the, the complaints about a ref getting caught swearing on the mic. I'm like, what are you complaining for? It's entertaining. Piss off. Yeah. Also. That's I'm sorry. That's the way refing works. The moment you get above like Pee Wee level, that's that's every ref on the ice, whether yeah. you like it or not. If you are not within earshot of the parents on the other side of the glass, that ref is going off on your kids. Hate to say it. <laughs> is it good? Probably not. I don't know. Players or coaches smell fear in the ref. It's like blood in the water. Yeah, yeah. You got to go out there and be a little bit of a prick. Yeah. Um. Anyhow, the fighting call, which was great the fight itself was great that was a good scrap a lot of like a lot of actual like haymakers thrown a lot of punches connected i mean the gagne fight in the fight with um uh, nemesnikov and marcia and those were more just like grappling matches and they threw him to the ground which is you don't want to see guys get hurt but middleton and, and Giovanni smith looked both tough guys and they both wanted to go at it and that was a good tilt yeah that's the sort of fights you like to see then the organic ones I have no idea what started the fight, but it was a good fight. Uh, Wes McCauley stole the show thereafter. And then the hit that Giovanni Smith laid on uh, Middleton saw him get five in a game. And my issue with that. So he got a five minute major for boarding. And I thought maybe they might nail him on the elbow, but they got him for boarding a five minute major. And then they reviewed it after. And I was like, I think what they're going to do here is they called it a five and they're going to bring it down to two. Because I've seen that hit go unpenalized against the Red Wings. Many oh, times. Many times. So I was like, I think they're going to bring this down to two. Um, 
I saw the elbow uh, like in, in the slow-mo replay, and I was like, ah, this might stick. But they kept it as five for boarding. Giovanni Smith got ejected. San Jose got a five-minute power play, which didn't end up working out for them. But we'll get to that. The hit itself, what, what did you think? Put this in a vacuum. Don't put this in the context of the Red Wings and what the standard – that's been called all year. We'll get to that in a second. But what was your evaluation of the hit itself? What would you have called it? Well, the NHL never calls these hits, so it's very difficult to say what you'd call it. Two minutes for embellishment. <laughs> <laughs> Evan goes full heel against the San Jose Sharks. Yeah, I don't know. Middleton really sold it, sat out the rest of the game and everything. Yeah, good for him. Way to really commit to the bit. No, I think he's actually hurt. <laughs> no, yeah. no, he's definitely hurt. Um. I think the problem with the evaluation on the hit was that they showed the slow-mo quite a bit and everyone's like Giovanni Smith slowed down and he I mean he didn't skate full speed into the Middleton in the end boards but that's because it you know he's preserving himself a little bit in my mind boarding was the right call I in my mind in a vacuum not considering everything else that's been called not called or not called against the Red Wings this year the major is justified. I could see it going either way, but I, I can understand the major. It wasn't a great hit. You don't want to see that happen in the game. There are questions I have about the way Middleton positioned himself, knowing that Giovanni Smith was there and how like hard he protected himself against that hit. I, I don't – I'm not the kind of person who likes to completely ignore that. But at the end of the day, Smith did deliver the hit. The elbow came up as well. I can understand it. I agreed with the call fully and you saw the Twitter reaction I got for that. Uh, I was, I I feel like I was very much in the minority. Well, no, I I know a lot of people are going to disagree. Yeah. Which is fine. Red Wings fans were very mad about the call as they should be, but not because the hit, the penalty was wrong. It's you should be mad because yeah, this has happened to the Red Wings a hundred times this year and has not been called this once. That's why you should be mad and you have every right to be mad. I know I was, but, and you can also, call Middleton an idiot for the way he positioned himself because it was he was in put himself in a bad spot in a bad time you don't do that I get the play he was trying to make but you got to get up against the boards to do that or else that's going to happen that all being said none of that matters you still can't make that hit just because the defending player does something stupid does not give you carte blanche to do what Smith did it's a hit where there's a separation between Middleton and the boards to the numbers, I don't care if it was to his spine or the back of his shoulder. It doesn't matter. Like, that does not matter in the rule book. And then you hit him from behind and drive his head into the glass. That should be a game and every time. A thousand percent of the time, it should be that. The reason everybody's mad is because it's, like I said, gone against the wings the other way a million times this year. And we should be mad about that. We've complained about that ad nauseum on this podcast. Like, this is how much of a joke of the league And the officiating and the Department of Player Safety is because this should be a game. uh, Like, you should be tossed from the game every time this happens. Then the first time they get it right, it goes against the Red Wings. Yeah, it's infuriating. But it was, like, again, in a vacuum, it was the right call. Because when I said that, every excuse I got has nothing to do with the rule book. And when you know those are the arguments you're making, you're not right. Because I got the Middleton shouldn't put himself in a position like that. You're right. He shouldn't. He still can't make the hit. Oh, well, this call's gone against the Red Wings. It hasn't gone uh, against the Red Wings all year. You're right. You still can't make that hit. Like when those, that's the only leg you have to stand on. It's wrong. Like it was a hit from behind with space between the boards where the player got injured. Like there's, there's no argument defending the hit in a vacuum. There, yeah. And that's the thing. The, the context behind the hit is perfectly fair. And that's, that's what I think the discussion should be around. It is frustrating. It is frustrating to know, like Middleton looked back. He knew Giovanni Smith was bearing down. Yeah. Was he welcoming the hit? Was he going to try to sell it? And did he get something a little bit more than he bargained for? Maybe. Yeah. Um, All of that's true. And even, <laughs> even if it, there wasn't the fight between them before, obviously they were, they were nipping at each other even after the fight. You, you just can't position yourself that way i don't he's not going to do it again he got his bell rung pretty hard this time like but unfortunately as much as it sucks and as much as much as this bullshit that the red wings have not had this kind of thing 
called in their favor. And I'm not even thinking the Larkin hit. You know which one I'm thinking of? Lucas Raymond on the end boards. That one, I can't remember that one game, but it was the same thing. It resulted in his head hitting off the glass and it rattled him. And I, th- he probably had a minor concussion after that and just played through it. But you, you unfortunately can't make that hit despite how stupid it is that it was called this time. You said a thousand percent of the time it should be called. I honestly think that hit gets five in a game one percent of the time. We saw it one time it happened this season. Oh, I know how many times it's called correctly, and it's rare. I, I honestly <laughs> think that might be the first time I've seen it called correctly. Like the the only correctly the only argument that people have, and it's a very it's a good argument is while well, the precedent isn't this and they're not wrong the way the rules written the severity of the play yada 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 it should be in a five a game but like you said it never is like many red wings fans pointed out why is this the one the precedent is not this oh well they're and gonna the, get it right every time moving forward we know that for oh sure. for sure a thousand percent <laughs> so like that that's a very very good argument it's unfortunately the only argument but it's it's a good argument, but you know I'm an advocate of player safety, so uh, yeah, you you got to get it right as much as you can. And hey, we all love Wes McCauley, but Wes McCauley is also one of the better refs in the league. There's a reason he gets the Cup Finals every year. His crew usually gets it right. So yeah, the Wings have not had the Wes McCauley crew for the other incidents. They get him for this game, and they get the call right. And unfortunately, it sucks for us because, yeah, the Pilat on Rasmussen, uh, I forget who it was on Raymond, Matthew Joseph on Larkin, and there's at least a couple others I'm forgetting. Some of them didn't even get a two-minute minor, and the ones that were called were only a two-minute minor. It's it's an NHL problem. It's not a – this was not a Wes McCauley problem. This was not a Jacob Middleton problem. This was – this is a bigger problem across the league. I also want to say I don't think Giovanni Smith was going into that those end boards looking at, to hurt Jacob Middleton. I think he was looking to punish him like he had yeah. an opportunity to lay a heavy hit, and I think that's what he wanted to do. Probably wasn't counting on Middleton no. setting himself up like that. He was definitely expecting Middleton to play that better than he did because, again, Middleton should not have left that much space between himself and the boards. Right. Not that you still can really make that hit, but the impact is lessened by it. But, yeah, it's... It sucks for Giovanni because you knew what he was doing. It sucks for Middleton because he got hurt. It sucks for Red Wings fans because we're in a no-win spot on this one. So yeah, everything about it sucks. Well, I know there's going to be a lot of disagreement on that one, and that's fine. That's what makes podcasts and these discussions good. So uh, please direct – if your comment is – like if, if you want to respectfully disagree, that's amazing. Leave your comment. And if you want to disrespectfully disagree, I actually welcome that. Just tweet at HockeytownEvan on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I'll be sure to see that. <laughs> Um, okay, so outside of that, the rest of the game actually was great for the Red Wings. 101 games without a shorthanded goal. 101 games. They passed the century mark. And you just knew after a controversial five-minute major and a, and a toss, the moment that went up, I'm like, the Red Wings with a five-minute penalty kill, it's happening. It just has to happen this way. They had to get to the 100-game mark, and it has to happen this way. What does Pew Suter do? Score uh, gets a breakaway on the power or on the penalty kill, I should say, and just snipes it home. Why is it home? It was perfect. The way Ken called it too. Like you just knew the moment he had that break. You're like, yep, yeah, this is it. A hundred and one game scoreless streak broken on the penalty kill, and that was fantastic. And then 37 seconds later, <laughs> I was uh, <laughs> still grabbing the clip for the first one, and then a tweet popped up on my feed. It was Brad. I think you said, like, holy shit, Bert just did it again or something like that. Tyler Bertuzzi, another shorthanded goal. So you go 101 games with none, and then you get Tyler Bertuzzi following up Hugh Suter's record or streak-breaking goal 37 seconds later. <laughs> Hockey's so dumb. It's the stupidest sport in the world. <laughs> By far, the stupidest sport, the absolute Red Wings. Of course, that's the way they're going to do who it. Says, anybody who says hockey's not random is wrong. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> and then I think that's the point moving forward. The moment the Red Wings walked away from that penalty kill, having scored more gil- more goals than San Jose after five minutes of power play, was you're like, yeah, this is Detroit's using this game to their advantage. Like they're They're taking their opportunity to properly bounce back here. There's a there's a likely reality here where for the next couple of weeks the Red Wings PK outscores the power play. <laughs> yeah, maybe based on how those things are going. Oof. 
the duality of Red Wings. Yeah, I was very excited to see this new look Red Wings power play. Uh, one of my few criticisms of the game. <laughs> well, it, they had one where it was like, ah, uh, like they had like a minute stretch. You're like, okay, this isn't bad. And then the rest was just fart noises. They didn't, yeah, they didn't do too much with it. I'll, I understand it's a work in progress and it's not going to get fixed overnight, but at least there's the PK to hold us over. Yeah. Um, For now. Pew Suter's second goal of the night, which was good. He buried it. I, I still love what Pew Suter's doing. I think he's around half a point per game, which considering his slower start to the year, awesome to see him settled in. Michael Rasmussen looked great on the wing. And he did a great job on that goal. And that was a great shift overall, actually. Yeah, it was one of Michael Rasmussen's best games as a pro. Yeah. On the wing. Weird. Who could have ever seen that coming? Was it you, Evan, who said that last episode? I, I believe it was. It yeah. was definitely Evan. It was Evan. I said something about that? Yeah, it was definitely you and not Brad about uh-huh. sticking Michael Rasmussen on the wing. Well, it worked. You were absolutely right. Brad, why don't you parrot what Evan's comments were last episode? Um, that oh, we do my last, memory for me, yeah. please. Yeah, I believe you've been saying actually for a, a long time now that Michael Rasmussen's game is much better suited to the wing, so he can focus on less and do the things he's better at more. And it worked. I was wa- I was uh, watching the condensed game this morning while I had my coffee, and at one point I was like, "Whoa, who is that? Someone was coming in with speed off the wing, and it wasn't Dylan Larkin." And then. Ken Daniels was like, oh, Michael Rasmussen with the shot. I was like, what? <laughs> uh, you have to like, you do that thing where like, you rub your eyes to make sure it's who the actually thought said it was. Yeah, I, I thought he had a quite a few productive shifts. You thought maybe for a second you poured too much rum chata on your coffee? Oh, I never think that. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys haven't, if the patrons haven't gone back and listened <laughs> to the Patreon exclusive overtime from last episode, I beg of you to do it. Just listen the first few minutes. It's the best one we've ever done. It's the worst one we've ever done, but it's the best one we've ever done. Like, my, the, set the, my sore throat back for three weeks for sure. Like, there's a conversation about Evan's day drinking after saying he doesn't drink. <laughs> I think the I think I used the phrase sentient jar of cottage cheese at one point. Oh, like, uh, that might have been that might have been actually in the main episode. Was it? Yeah. It was. It was. We very unhinged. Yeah, it wasn't. Uh, it was our best. I'll say it was our best. But no, Michael Rasmussen. Yeah, like he was doing things where you put it well, Brad. I think it was more. It was playing more to what his actual capabilities were and freeing him up from trying desperately to be a middle six center in the NHL, which he, he can't really do consistently, to put it lightly at this All level. Right, well. You free him up from that and it allows him to do the things in his game, which he displayed in that Pew Suter goal. That's what we need to see more of. That's how Michael Rasmussen can be effective on this team. Exactly. It allows him – not that it allows him to do anything differently be, per se because – you know, driving wide, getting the puck to the net, all those little things. Rasmussen can do that at center or wing, but pulling him off center and putting him on wing um, prevents his flaws from being exposed. What? It allows him to focus not solely, but primarily on his strengths. What is good deployment other than guarding flaws? Right? Like, Yeah. yeah. That's the, that's what gets us about the Thomas Vanek treatment, if you will. They did a great job with that. <laughs> that's what gets us about Michael Rasmussen is, and I hate referring to us as a collective because it, it implies agreement across the board and especially with Brad, which doctors recommend against heavily. Um, he's not, he's not defunct as an NHL player. He's not without capacity at the NHL level and he's still so young. He has capacity to grow. And so I don't really subscribe to the throw it all away thing. I just subscribe to the stop making him out to be something he's not. If you're so determined to make him into a middle six center in the NHL, you got to work with him in the off season because he's not that right now and you have to ease into it. You never will be. I don't think he will be either. But right now, as his game is right now, stick him stick him in this role. Put him on the wing with a, a skilled center or someone who's able to, to be where he – like be in the open space. So when he works hard to get those puck or get those pucks out front, like he did for Pew Suter there, there's someone there to receive it and bury it. And that's where the production comes from. You have to utilize it. It was good to see. Yeah. Um, you saw, did you guys see Joe Valeno catch that or like kind of dribble that puck out of the air, bounce it off the ice. And then like, yes, he caught that in the air and then just kept it going. That was hysterical. The balls to even try that is amazing. I don't know. 
I don't know what the end result would have been there. Like, I would love to say, like, if that turned into a goal, I don't know what that, how that. The only way that play like. works is you eventually get to the point you just bat it over the defenseman and then win the race. Can but, you imagine? Okay. I would have lost my damn mind. I would have sprinted to the LCA. Trevor Zegers, who? That'd have been the goal of the year by a mile. Oh yeah, they would. Well, the NHL would then make that like. Talk about that for three weeks. Oh my, three years. Print the shirts. <laughs> yeah, honestly, Joe Valeno gets selected first overall in next year's draft. Don't ask us how. They're just going to do it. Um, all that came before Lucas Raymond and Dylan Larkin connecting for one of, I think, my favorite Red Wings goals of the year, though. Oh, easily. That was incredible. Both Larkin and Raymond. I don't want to discount what Larkin did on that play year because I thought it was very quintessential. This is why Larkin is producing this year. Yeah, Raymond has the through the legs touch pass to set it up for Larkin in stride who just goes and clowns the defenseman on San Jose without even throwing a deke and then just rips it right under the bar. It was that whole play was just beautiful. That the between the legs backhand pass almost hit his left skate too. It was that close to not reaching Larkin, but the presence of mind to turn see Larkin streaking, knowing he has that there and then draw the defender away by, pulling him in like that oh just so good just so good it was also good because raymond hasn't scored in what like nine ten games now something like that and i don't think up to that point he was having a particularly good game no i was actually almost going to say like hey this would be a great time for lucas raymond to get a freebie stick him on the empty net put him on a power play against a dejected team something like that um he actually missed the net or barely got a uh saved by the goalie on a uh, pretty good chance late in the game but no, having that assist come through, I thought it was good. I think it was important for his night because, yeah, he it wasn't uh, it wasn't a Lucas Raymond night. No, he looked off a lot of chances that he probably normally would not have. And then Fabry made it six, and that was the uh, that was the game. San Jose put two in the net, but other than that, they weren't able to do much. And the Red Wings got a much needed win. That was it was important. Not a perfect game, no, but it was a really, really good one, and it's one that they should have won, and it was a really important one to get, especially now that they're going to go on the road. They got Anaheim on Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern, L.A. on Saturday at 10.30 p.m. Eastern, and then actually next Tuesday in San Jose, again, 10.30 Eastern. So those are three games in California. It's going to be a road trip. They're back in Detroit on the 13th, so it's nice to kick that off with the Red Wings win. Let's talk about the Philip Zadina in the room. Philip Zadina, no. healthy scratched coming into this game. Um, they're looking to ignite something, light a fire under him. Thoughts? First thing I'm going to talk about just to get out of the way is Blashill said he just needed a reset, which I think everybody with half a brain knows it's bullshit. They just came off a two-week break. Did he mean physical reset, though, or did he mean like a mental reset? Either way, they had a two-week break. Everybody got a reset. Everybody. I, I don't read too much into the comments. Like, no, because well, that's that's my point. Blashill was going to say whatever the hell he was going to say. He wasn't going to give us a real answer. Like, ah, <laughs> yeah. Zena out tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and not that Blashill will or should ever tell the media an honest answer. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm not. It's not their job. Yeah. I'm not piling on Blashill for saying what he said, because, of course, he was going to say nothing. So anybody who's taking that statement literally shouldn't. Uh, what I am going to criticize Blasha for is Zadina should not have been a healthy scratch. Because Zadina, we can't defend his lack of production at this point because he's got to figure it out. Yeah. He has to. He's generated a billion chances. He's not finishing any of them. He's gotten to the point over the last uh, five or six games where you can see he's just lost all confidence in his ability to score. And it's reflecting in the decisions he's making when he gets to that point, mm -hmm. you know, looking off shots or trying to rush shots or trying to make passes that aren't there. Yeah. I, I don't have a hell of a lot to say there, but then it comes back to this conversation we've had over the years. Should different players have different levels of accountability and what your answer is to that question should dictate how you feel about this. If your answer is yeah, different levels different players should have different expectations and different levels of accountability, then yes, you can absolutely justify Zadina being scratched. If you're like, no, this is hockey. It's a team sport. Everybody should be held to the same, you know, level of accountability. Then Zadina wasn't in the bottom 
six candidates of guys who should have been scratched because he was far from the biggest problem on this team. And you can count on two hands players who are playing worse than Philip Zadina, even relative to their own expectations because Zadina is playing great in 90% of the ice. It's just once he gets to the net, he clams up. Which again, I'm not justifying that. He needs to figure that shit out, but he's playing solid defensively. He's playing great in transition. He's playing, his zone entries are still fantastic. He's still distributing the puck to his teammates well. He just, he just can't put it all together once he gets there. You know, you can't sit here and tell me that Sam Gagne, Adam Ernie, Carter Rowney, Giovanni Smith, even Joe Valano, you can't tell me any of those guys are playing overall better than Zadina. There's not a leg to stand on for that. So, again, it comes back to, do you think Zadina needs to be held to a higher level of accountability? If yes, then you can justify it. If no, then you can't. Do you think it's justified? Philip Zadina had three points in November. Philip Zadina hasn't scored since November. I mean, it's a performance-driven environment. I mean, almost every job is at this point. He looked like... I think he's been really good this year, but at some point, like, there has to be some some results. Like, you can't always just, oh, he's putting in all this effort and it's just not happening. Like, at some point, it has to happen. Like, you can talk about it all you want. Yeah. Be like, oh, he looks good. He just doesn't finish. It's like, well, what are we doing here? I have to think, yeah, I, I have to err towards the side of, like, as painful as it is, because you see... I think this was true probably up until around when the break happened. I agree. Yeah, Zadina was doing a lot right on the ice, especially what the coaches and the team asked of him, spreading out his game and being more effective up and down the ice, 200 feet. The chances were there. The shooting percentage is like on the cat- cataclysmically low, especially for someone who has his supposed level of shooting talent, which we have seen displayed in the past. And that was all painful to watch because you're like, it's got to break at some point. But yeah, you're not wrong. Like, unless he's working for the government, it's a, it's a, like, <laughs> that is true. That is true. You, you can take a shit on someone's desk and you're getting a promotion. A hundred percent. Like, you, unfortunately, he's, he's not. And so he has to be able to produce. And this isn't about a, oh, the Red Wings can't have wasted a six overall pick. It's a, no, the Red Wings know what they have in him. And that's why I do subscribe to the different players have different levels. Of accountability. If Philip Zadina was drafted as you know the player we thought he was, and he never once in his NHL career displayed those skills, I would say, all right, well, we were wrong about Philip Zadina. He doesn't have those skills. We've seen bouts, like long, good sample sizes of Philip Zadina's play where we're like, yeah, this is a guy that can net 20. He's on a 25 goal pace or whatever it is. And a lot of people are going to be saying, yeah, Ryan, 25 goal pace, but you need to translate it. And you are absolutely right. A hundred percent. All I'm saying is you can see the talent there. And it's on at the end of the day, it's on Zadina. Is it on the coaching staff as well to unlock it? Yeah, I think that's part of what coaching staffs do. Coachings, yeah, coaching staffs do. But like Brad said, you can't really pile on Blashill or Tange or anyone for this. Like Zadina has to convert, and it's not. You can't just make broad strokes here. I mean, here. I can pile on Tangay a bit for this. Like, the, yeah, that power play. Does that stop. power play. Yeah. <laughs> People are like, oh, well, he's getting power play time. I'm like, yeah, that's not really advantageous right play? now. <laughs> and he's on the second unit. Have you seen who he's playing with on that power play? <laughs> but you can boil it down also to smaller plays where you're like, hey, here's where Zadina had a free look. Or, hey, here's where Zadina had a one-time pass that was in a lot of players' wheelhouse. And he just he gripped it too tight. He fired it over the net. He didn't. He double clutched. He did whatever. And there's just too much of that. And one point you made, Brad, that I think is especially prevalent of late, you can see it creeping into the rest of his game. It changes the way you approach the puck. It changes each possession. It changes how easy it is to defend against you. I'm speaking in generalities here, but overall, he's kind of losing losing the plot a little bit when he's an otherwise great player. I think a reset is the right move here. He's one of those guys who's like, his game is very, it revolves a lot around his confidence. Yeah. And when he doesn't have any confidence, you can see it in every facet of his game. But when he gets just even a touch of confidence, his game unlocks things we didn't know he possessed. So I think Philip Zadina is still part of the solution. Um, He just, yeah, the reset. I, I 
we'll see. We'll see if it does anything. But I, I don't think giving up on Philip Zadina is really in the cards at all. No, it'd yeah. be silly to give up on him at this point. Yeah, that's an aside. If if you're one of those Red Wings fans on Twitter, and I'm seeing more and more of them, just like every like your name's like Brad Crisco, yeah. and you tweet too Bunch much. Of numbers. God. Yeah, if you're one of the Bobby Bunch of numbers yelling "bust" or "this guy sucks" or you're you're rooting for the guy to fail. You suck as a fan. I'm sorry. There's no way around that. Like, Definitely sucks in terms of overall production. Yeah. Like, if you just look at the counting stats, he he sucks. I think there's a difference between calling out someone who's sucking and wanting someone to suck. Yeah, exactly. Like if you're like, man, this guy's got to start scoring. Valid criticism. If you're like, bust, you suck. I don't even. I think it's. I don't. I, he's not a bust. You can't make that declaration. Exactly. Yet. He's twenty two. Um, this is his first like quote unquote full NHL season. <laughs> like, but hey, man, that I I'm of the mind that fans should be allowed to boo, scream that people suck. Oh yeah, when, no, I'm not. I'm saying he they can't. I'm just saying I'm judging you poorly for doing it. No, well, if you're criticizing, fine. If you're just yelling, boss, this guy sucks. We n- no don't like if you're like oh here he's not scoring he like Evan said he has to produce no argument valid criticism you want to have that conversation go for it just I've seen a lot of Bobby Bunchy numbers and a lot of posts about Zadina lately and it's becoming way more prevalent he is the team's absolutely he is the team's whipping boy he is yeah. he is the Nylander or Marner depending on where Toronto's at. And how they're playing, which I think is neither this year right now. Um, he's I'm trying to think of examples on other teams. But again, it, like harks back to what Evan was saying. Hey, you remember the when the, the last guy this really happened to this way in Toronto? Uh Willie Nylander? He was their best player in the playoffs last year. Uh, well, the last and guy he's is- a and he's playing at a star level this year. It's weird how those things work out. Well, I mean, if Philip Zadina wants to be Willie Nylander, that'd be really good. Yeah, he's not going to be Willie Nylander. But I'm just <laughs> saying, a lot of Leaf fans were ready to write him off. The last players that, like, I think the previous whipping boys for the Red Wings were uh, Anthony Mantha and Andreas Athanasiu. And they had varying levels of production. Yeah. I, 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 all I'm saying is I can understand why it's... I think people who root in bad faith and are just not willing to hope for any kind of positive change in a player, I think that's crummy. Which is ridiculous because that's counterintuitive to your fandom. It'd be right? Exactly yeah. my point. Like, I want this guy to suck. It's like, well, then your team's going to suck. Yeah. That doesn't yeah, make not, any sense. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, this guy sucks. I'm like, well, he's doing this. This isn't great. No, I don't scoring. He sucks. I'm like, okay, well, if you're just going to be. Okay. Enjoy, enjoy hate watching it. Yeah. I'll, well, <laughs> welcome to the Wingville podcast. <laughs> yeah, fair. yeah. All I'm saying is, yeah, I think it's a fair game. If a guy's sucking, call out that he sucks. I don't care. It's not the way I, I, well, sometimes, depending on the sport I'm watching, but it's not the way I would root for the Red Wings. But I think it's fair. If you have a lot of expectations and you're underproducing, it, it's going to come. You don't have to like it. No, I don't like it. And I hate it. And I will call out every one of those idiots in my mention happily. Well, I hate you, Brad. I know. That's not anything to do with this. I actually had it a note. Tell Brad I hate him. I'm just assume you're half the burner accounts in my... Uh... I am. <laughs> yeah. I bought a second phone, actually. <laughs> Ran out of space. S- smart. Don't have to keep logging in and out. Oh, that's smart. That's... I should get another phone. Yeah, exactly. Um, Hitting that switch profiles. Dude, that's such a pain. In... Nobody does that. It's such nobody. a pain in the ass. Well, you pointed this out in pre-recording. The Guelph line... Separated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Five of the six Red Wings goals courtesy of the Guelph Storm. Thank you. <laughs> I actually had to think for a second. I was like, Suter, Fabry. Oh, yeah. Suter, Bertuzzi, Fabry. I forgot Fabry got the yeah. sixth one, but yeah. One literal line in Guelph. So uh, that's the Red Wings game. They broke the shorthanded streak. Raymond made an amazing play on the Larkin goal. Rasmussen looked r- effective. Guelph. Produced a lot for the Red Wings. The Smith ejection was painful for reasons other than Speaking the actual hit. Yeah, no, sh- yeah, another one right there. Painful for reasons other than that. Zadina sat, and then Wes McCauley stole the show. Other than all that, all that happened. Eight goals. The Red Wings won, and Wes McCauley is still the story. Then it was a very eventful game. It was. It was a fun game. We were. I think we were talking about before Red Wings Twitter. That was that was the best form I've seen Red Wings Twitter in in years. What's, the the memes were a flying. the The happiness was radiating through the phone screen. 
people were ratioing Brad. It was great. It was awesome. I still don't know what that is. It's when someone has more like comments and quote tweets than likes. If something is getting if you see a lot yeah. of retweets and comments but not a lot of likes. Is that the, bad? Yeah, those yeah. retweets are quote tweets dunking on the person and oh. the comments are ripping on them. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's all about the likes. Yeah. Yeah. For example, I I got ratioed last night. It was like it was funny to watch, but because I posted the Giovanni Smith hit, people were mad that he got ejected. So it was like fifty comments on it, and I was just and like, no "Oh, sweet. Likes. yeah!" I was like, "I'm okay. being ratioed. This is great." Okay, I didn't do it, but hey, I got it. God, get... I feel like a boomer. You are a boomer. Yeah, you're actually both boomers. I don't know how to tell you this other than that you are both boomers in a way. Oh, I feel like a boomer all the time when I talk to people in their early twenties. I don't relate to them at all. You don't relate to people your own age. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Who do you relate to? I would like to um, know. I don't know. The top 30 ranked golfers on the PGA <laughs> Tour? Like, who is God, it? <laughs> I wish I related to them in any, well, at least the degree of relation. God. Does be Jeff nice. Bezos play golf? Yeah, Evan actually lent Jeff Bezos that shirt that he was wearing. But they were like, he's slowly turning into Pitbull. <laughs> 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 oh, God. Uh all right. Um, did you guys see that Kale McCargill? Yes. Holy shit. How do we get one of those? Poor Kirby Doc. He didn't do his best. It was not the best display of defense, but his soul got stolen on the ice, and it would have been a forgettable play had had Kale McCarr not absolutely embarrassed the rest of the Chicago Blackhawks on the ice. Including. Kale McCarr didn't even know who that was. No. He's like, ah, that guy was like overcommitted. He's like, I think that's Evan Lobsinger. It pretty much could have been. The way that guy moves, I don't care if you say he's an uh, uh, an offensive player playing defense. He's a forward playing defense. Does not matter. Nobody should be able to move like that. He's like a Dyson, like one of those Dyson vacuums with the sphere. He turns on a dime. Oh my god! And he was gone. What a freak! It reminded me a lot of the the um, McDavid on uh, Morgan Riley play, where he kind of just like. Sells like he's going yeah. one direction. All of a sudden, the burners are on and he's yeah. gone. Yeah. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not moving. Look how slow I'm going. Gone. They showed that in Morgan Riley's contract negotiations. They're like, see, this is an example of you playing not great defense. And Morgan Riley showed him a hundred, showed him a like hundred examples of McDavid doing that to anyone else in the league. Like it's, they it's just more impressive that he could do it on Morgan Riley. Just made him look so stupid. Oh, man. Yeah. Poor. Poor Kirby Doc. That's going to be on the poster for a while. <laughs> a long time. <laughs> he he did that thing, and you pointed this out on Twitter, Brad, where he um, closed his feet to try to stop the pass across, and that stopped him really from having his feet set to – not that I think he could have matched no, the car stop that on a didn't dime. No, matter at all. But it just made it look that much worse. Yeah. He's, <laughs> he sent him to the other zone. Like <laughs> Kirby Doc was practically on the bench by the time, by the time that was over. Oh, Kirby Doc was on the plane before uh, Kale McCarr stopped celebrating. I would be too. I'd be pulling that trap door very quick. I oh, burned yeah. a year off his ELC. Don't ask me how. <laughs> Man. Yeah, that was... Uh, how do we get one of those is the right answer. Fourth overall in the draft. Hey, we got a pretty good player at that spot. Yeah, we got. We did get a pretty good player at that spot. Uh, we were talking about the, the, world, the world juniors, the um, winter classic numbers. That game rated really well. Ton of viewers. TNT did a good job with that show. So honestly, that was great to see. And so I think we were a little wrong about the actual viewership numbers. Although the classic always gets a big draw. It's a stadium series that doesn't necessarily get a lot. Mm -hmm. But it really just furthers my point. Why did they schedule any other games at that time? All scheduling issues aside. Oh, speaking of which, uh, Red Wings Flyers on the 18th got postponed. I think they're just doing a lot of... the 18th. What day is it? January 18th. Fifth. Yeah. Oh my God, it's the 5th? Wow. The game on the 18th in like 13 days has been canceled. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're anticipating a lot of COVID. No, um, future I, contact tracing. I think yeah. it's um, schedules. Like they had to set to reshuffle games. And oh, I see. Yeah, so it probably works more to reschedule Detroit and Philly on a different night. Or... Say that's that's very proactive. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be the person having to navigate this on the the hockey side of things. Well, it's good for Detroit, right? Because looking, it looks like it's a back to back with Buffalo d the day before. Yeah, and you don't want boats to. well for Detroit. Yeah, I was uh, I was thinking about schedules, and I was thinking about Gary Bettman, who did make a comment again recently about wanting the Winter Olympics or the uh, 
the any the hockey NHL players to go to the Olympics for for hockey to be played in the Summer Olympics rather than winter. Oh yeah, we did. Did we ever talk about that? We didn't really dive into it too much. And look, it makes no sense from the actual spirit of the sport. It is the winter sport. It's probably the main draw in terms of viewership for the Winter Olympics if NHL players are going. And that's not to discount from like curling and figure skating and all that stuff, which actually does get a, dancing. a ton of viewers. But that aside, it works great with the schedule, right? Yeah, if you can detach yourself from the fact that it'd be a winter sport being played in the summer, like it's better in every way. It's just so weird. God, that would be nice sitting outside watching the, the Winter Olympics. Yeah, or hockey in the Olympics. Oh, that'd be amazing. It would I be would really break cool. into Evan's backyard and set up a projector right next to the hot tub. Well, he's inviting us. <laughs> right, Evan? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> Or the Anakin and Padme meme. I really want a 4K projector, so that uh, bodes well. Did you not just get? Did he not just get like a 90 inch TV? How big is 85? 77. Oh my god, what a peasant! Yeah, but I want this the project. I've got a projector, but it's a sh- it's garbage. How's the TV? Oh yeah, <laughs> it bangs. <laughs> it bangs. <laughs> Brad just held a knife to his throat in his head. You should hear the sound system. Oh my goodness. I have a sound bar. I have a sound bar too. It is a sound bar, but it's got two satellite speakers. It's great. It's uh, really nice. He put his wallet down in the kitchen. I'll let you snag it downstairs. There's I'll, nothing I'll left. It's already fallen through the floor and it's now in your basement. Oh, well, no, it's coming back from that. Um, anything else that we want to cover? Any, anything else that happened across the league? Um, PK, you actually mentioned it pre-show last, uh, before last episode, but did you see PK Subban attempted to slew foot someone else? If the NHL is not going to suspend them, the players need to do something about it, which I'm, it's going to happen. Yeah. Someone's going to get hurt, but now at, for us, the longer this goes on, the less likely the player that's going to get hurt is one of the guys Subban slew foots and it's going to be Subban when someone just takes a run. Yeah. Yeah, they will. It sounds dumb to say they need to suspend him for his own safety, but uh, it's getting there. How many times in this league have we seen something happen and us say, if the NHL fans say, if the NHL does not penalize this, there will be retribution. The players will police the game and it will not be good. They are. It's going to be ridiculous. How much further do you need to look than the Tom Wilson New York Rangers incident at the end of last season? That's it. People are going to get hurt and it's going to be Subban. Or honestly, even worse, if he goes out and be Jack Hughes. ruins someone's career. Yeah, like they're going to go after Jack Hughes. That's the way it if works. If PK's not going to answer the bell and be a be a baby like he is, then they go after somebody else. Like that's just how it works. And it's just the NHL <clears throat> cannot seem to get this one right. It'll happen. It'll come to a point where there'll be a situation that follows along the lines of something like Subban goes to slew for the guy. Tough guy on uh, whatever team goes up to Subban. All right, we're fighting now. Subban, as he usually does, will go, no. And then tough guy will go, okay, fight me now or I'm putting Hughes into the fourth row. It's going to happen. And it will be Tom Wilson. Yeah. (laughs) But honestly, maybe. And Devils fans are going to be pissed off because their star center is going to be out of the game for a while. And there's going to be a whole thing about it. And everyone's going to be really angry. You know what's going to happen? P.K. Subban is going to get slew-footed. And he's going to get hurt, and that player will get suspended. That that's when they're going to call it. That is when the first that time. is when the suspension will happen. Yeah, Feels oddly get... familiar to recent events in Detroit. Yeah, yeah, it does, doesn't it? I can't really put my finger on it. <laughs> Did you guys see Gerard Gallant accidentally hit Ryan Reeves in the face? No, but that sounds hysterical. <laughs> so the, did you see the other night when he was like snapping at the ref about something? And he, yeah. the ref like had a, pulled out a book or something, and he took it from his hand. Well, in that instant, he hit Ryan Reeves right in the face. <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. That's all I had. Gerard Glantz, uh, he's a funny guy to watch, and I love his interviews. He's a great press conference. He seems like a good dude. He does. He definitely seems like a player's coach, and he doesn't just snap for theatrics. Like He actually is <laughs> well, pissed off. He knocks him right in the face, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's funny. It was just- a great... <laughs> Bonk. Does Reeves have uh, no visor? Does he have a grandfathered in? He has yeah. no visor. Yeah, he's one of the guys who's. How many are there left with that? 
It's got to be less than 10 now. Oh, man. For those who don't know, at one point, the NHL mandated visors on all players' helmets, uh, except for those who are currently wearing without one on their bucket. So you could be grandfathered in, but the moment, if you were new to the league... Is it even once you start wearing a visor, you can't take it off again or something? I don't like that? think that applies. No, mm. but Ryan O'Reilly. Oh yeah, Jamie Ben. Jamie Ben does, and you know what? I hate the look because it reminds me of Jamie Ben. Chara with a visor is weird. Oh, there's a lot. Huh. Jamie and Jordy. Um, Ryan Getzlaff. Yeah, I think Zach Cassian. It'll be a while before those are gone. Then Lou Cheech, Matt Martin. There's a there's a trend. Brewing here, by the way. <laughs> Wayne Simmons, how Joe much? Thornton. How much do you breathe out of your mouth? Yes. The higher. When the did mouth? you last discover fire? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Well, we're starting to get a little ridiculous here, so let's jump into overtime. Uh, overtime on this episode of the Wind Wheel Podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Our Patreon supporters uh, actually never get a penalty call wrong. They're always right about everything. Even if they disagree with each other, somehow everyone is right. Patreon.com slash Podcast. if you want to support the show. Uh, I promise you none or all of your contributions will go to Evan's uh, 4K projector fund. You just have to tell me what you prefer. Absolutely nothing goes to Brad. Everything goes to Mika and Hank. Brad gets nothing. Good day. Uh, Brendan Taylor says, Happy New Year's, boys. Uh, each of you give me a player you are very wrong about and very right about from the time they're drafted to what they turned out to be in the league. I'm going first because I'm taking the easy answer. Moritz Sider and Lucas Raymond. Because <laughs> that's it. God damn it. Yeah. Or is this limited to just Red Wings? No. Oh, man. Evan, you go. I'm sure you got a long list of answers on this oh, one. Oh, uh... yeah. Moritz Sider was a fine player, a good player that we wanted the Red Wings to draft, and we were all very wrong about him not being worth it at six overall based on who else was there. And Lucas Raymond was someone we were very, very right about because we thought even at fourth overall, he had the chance to be playing well above that level. I need a lot of time to think about this. Yeah, this is not... There's like so many drafts coming into my brain at once, I can't even think... You got to do the like uh, the Sherlock like numbers floating around in front of you. Yeah, I'm trying to do the calculus on this. We'll come back to it when you guys are ready. Yeah, I'm. Well, the one player that I've been proven right about who's not in the NHL right now is Brandon Coe. He's leading the OHL in scoring. Oh, is he? Yep. Hmm. Um, Jeff Lehman has a question about Zadina, saying, "I love Zadina, but do we trade him?" He's great, but there's a level to him that we can't seem to unlock. When do we start looking at a good home for him and uh, where we can get value back a la Mantha? Here's the thing. I don't see a Mantha return for Zadina out there. Not right now. Mantha, Mantha had a pedigree and at least some history of scoring. Mantha didn't play up to his level in my mind in Detroit with any semblance of consistency, but you saw enough there where you're like, you know, Mantha can be this player. I just don't know that Zadina – I think Zadina's value is as low as it's ever been right now, so I don't think it trades a solution. I'm not saying a never trade this guy. I just don't see it as being a solution right now. No, it's definitely not. Uh, I have my answer to the previous question, and I'm going to be an asshole. Uh, player, I was very wrong about what I thought they'd be to this point anyway, Philip Zadina. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why did we not say that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and player that we were very right about, uh, I'm going to take your – Wrong answer, and I'm going to sneak into the same draft. Trevor Zegers. We were, oh yeah, we were very right about Trevor Zegers. Yeah, Trevor Zegers was great. Yeah, it does. Again, it's a small comfort to be wrong about Cider, knowing that Zegers was who we wanted. Yeah, we were big on Zegers. I mean, Turcotte too, but we won't talk about that one. <laughs> He's still fine. We'll see how that turns out. Yeah, injuries have kind of masked how that's going. Um. Let's go forward here with Ruthless and Toothless asking, do you think, do you ever think that giving the A is used strategically? In recent years, you may have noticed that the A uh, has been given to players uh, on their way out. Do you think that's done as a strategy for trade bait? And does a player have more value if traded with an alternate captaincy? Nope. Matters absolutely not at all. I can see it mattering to people. Why not? You player GMs and coaches trade for players for worse reasons than that. Having an A shows that you're a locker room guy. It's an easier sell for a GM to say, hey, look, he's our alternate captain. He's loved in the room. You got a bunch of talent. Great leadership. Yeah. Lots of intangibles. You have a lot of talent, but no glue. 
trade for this guy and he'll bring everyone together and galvanize them. Who, who are the Red Wings alternate captains this year? Danny DeKaiser. Don't you besmirch the good name of Mark Stahl ever again. Don't do it. Just saying. Anyways. <laughs> Mark Stahl with the coolest damn visor in the league. Dude, Mark Stahl is the living, living embodiment of rock star shit. But uh, <laughs> that, that A is putting a multiplier on a trade value of zero. Again, I have one rule on this podcast is don't be mean to Mark Stahl. And here it's he on is. on the door on the way in. Yeah, smartwatch on. I do. That's new. Uh, relatively. I got a new watch. What did you get? Uh, I got an Orient Sun and Moon. I got it in black. I don't know what that is. Best bang. It's a really good bang for your walk, buck for an automatic watch. Hmm. I really like it. I am uh, I have to talk myself out of buying nice watches quite a bit. I had I allowed myself one nice watch purchase in my life, and this one was not like. I have one. a couple buddies who are super into watches, and it just does nothing for me. Yeah, it's they, not like, for everyone. They are whenever celebrities have their watches on, they are like drooling at the TV. It is ridiculous. Do any. We'll talk later. What uh, what brand is that? Actually, no free ads. Yeah, no free ads. Uh, they can sponsor us, though. That'd be yeah. sweet. <laughs> Hit us up, mysterious watch company. Uh, Large the Prophet of the Towering Behemoth says, I think Lindstrom is a very useful player to have. Defensively reliable. He'll never become expensive, which means he's the perfect third pair D when we have the Sider, Edvinson, and Johansson Hronik pairs in the top two. He wouldn't be too hard to move if he eventually gets supplanted by a more recent draft D. Brad, you were very low on Lindstrom in his early days with the Wings. Have you changed your opinion on him? No, because I thought his ceiling is exactly what you just described. So I think we're on the same page here. Like, I thought his ceiling was a number five, six, seven defenseman, and he's showing to be a five, six, seven defenseman. I think if this is two flavors of the same opinion is what I'm getting. I think... a. I think you guys are saying the same things, but you're coming at it from a more, yeah, he's third pairing and Lars is coming at it from a more, hey, this guy's like third pairing. Like he's solid there. Yeah. I just came off as negative because like the comments on Lindstrom for a while were hyping him up to be something he wasn't like, well, same thing was happening with Rasmussen last year because everybody saw his improvement. They're like, oh, we got something here. And it's like, well, yes, but not what you think. And the same things with Lindstrom. He's like, oh, hey, Lindstrom's great. I'm like, yes, but not what you think. And so, you know, we always hope players hit their ceiling. I think what Lindstrom's ceiling was when he was drafted is never going to be met. But what the realistic ceiling is now, it seems very likely that he's going to hit. So, and that ceiling is a bottom pair, not train wreck of a defenseman. Brad focuses on the margins a lot, eh? Like, he gets the most marginal opinion, and that's what he... uh... That's where the, because, the Twitter battles are won and lost, Ryan. <laughs> because those are the ones people come at me for, and I don't know why. Because you're an easy target, my friend. And you're, oh, actually, I have you're far not. worse. You'll take the bait. <laughs> I don't even read the bait. You can't so. even read. <laughs> I have far worse opinions that people should can and should come at me for. That's what I don't get. <laughs> um, quick interlude here. I want to thank uh, Jack Robidoux sent us a lot of really great Red Wings um, merch and stuff for the studio. I have not had a chance to fit it into the studio yet, but you'll start to see it on the in the shot on YouTube. I'm going to cycle that stuff through. Um, Jack, really, really appreciate you sending that, man. And everyone who um, has sent us stuff, it's been incredibly kind, incredibly generous, and we love, 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 love showing it off in the studio. Um, Andrew Richardson asks, over, under, on Larkin, 40 goals. Under. I'm an under on that. Uh, I'll take the under just because I think at some point he'll <coughs> he'll sell out for the assists. Life motto: <laughs> keep the bar low, and then that's pretty much it. Under promise, over deliver. Exactly. That's why we're. That's why we've learned our lesson. We just got to get the over deliver part down. Yeah. <laughs> Not us personally. The Red Wings. We'll never be there. No. Um, Michael Barry. Interesting question here. If the Oilers miss the playoffs, does Ken Holland get fired? No. I think you see his cycles of uh, coaching changes before oh we start. Oh, my God. We should have talked oh. about the Edmonton, that whole shit with Koskin. And my God, that organization sucks and doesn't deserve Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. Let's do it right now. Why not? Their coach sucks. They've won. He's been bad this whole time. You have Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl and they're perpetual failures. Um, They're what? Two, uh, eight and two in their last 12 or something like that. And those two wins came. 
in the two ga- two of the games Dave Tippett was out because of COVID protocol, he absolutely sewers his goalie in the media. And then his goalie comes back, goes, yeah, I can be better, but you guys have scored seven goals and my six losses combined. So maybe I'm not the problem here. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but good on Koskinen because the Oilers goaltending save percentage, like as a whole this year is 904. That's not good. League average is 905. Is that league average? Yep. So he is terrible. Goaltending is not this team's biggest issue. It's certainly not a strength, but it's not the biggest issue. Um, and yeah, because the Edmonton Oilers are the absolute epitome of the old boys club jokes we make over and over in the NHL, Tip is not going to get fired. Holland's not going to get fired because the people above them, this is the way they operate. And this team is going to absolutely waste Connor McDavid and Leon Draisaitl's prime unless McDavid and Draisaitl themselves <laughs> somehow hit another level and drag this team to success kicking and screaming, which they've shown they can do on occasion. So <laughs> it is just so frustrating, and I hate everything about it. How could we have known that Duncan Keith, Cody Cece, and Tyson Berry would not make up a good half of your decor? Weird. How could we have known that? Nobody saw this coming. Absolutely nobody. I don't think Ken Holland came into a particularly good situation no, in Edmonton. Um, I have my thoughts and feelings about what you can even do if you're any GM in that situation. It's hard because I go like every deadline when Ken Holland is like, I'm not selling the farm to go for it. And I'm like, you got to go for it when the you have the two of the best players on the planet. One of them who is on a different He's on a different plane of existence. But on the flip hand, also what I just said, right? Like this team has so many holes. How do you fill it with the restraints of the of the current cap system and the contracts that have been handed out by Torelli and, and GMs previous? I I see Holland not achieving. I would I would love to eat my words because I think the more hockey we see Ken, or um, Connor McDavid play, the better. I'd love to eat my words on this. And I'm not saying it's a guarantee, but I don't see Ken Holland achieving a cup with Connor McDavid there. And right now, I would honestly put money if I had to pick one or the other that McDavid leaving is more likely than Edmonton winning a cup anytime soon. Yes. Fact. Um, Ken, you're not wrong. Ken Holland came into a tough situation. He walked into a team that had an absolute black hole of depth offense, and their defense was patchwork at best. He somehow made both of those worse. Yeah, their defense was kind of on the up and up with Evan yeah. Shard coming in. Darnell, Darnell Nurse was really becoming, a, I'll say, a, I don't want to say superstar, but like he has been very, very good and continues to get better. Like you don't have to do much when you've got Connor McDavid and Leon Drysaddle. You just have to give them the competent bums. And their depth is not good. Ryan Nugent Hopkins is having a good year. Everybody else is terrible. You know who's having a good year? Ethan Bear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Cody CC. 3.25, four more years. Three more years after this one. I don't even know if he's been good or bad this year, honestly. I know he had a little bit of a reprisal. He's been bad. Yeah. Well. The best thing about... The Edmonton, being an Edmonton Oilers fan is you've got Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid. So the games are usually never boring. The bad thing is is you're wasting Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid, which I, I, is probably worse than not having them at all. It's an affront to hockey. It's it's disrespectful to hockey fans everywhere. That's the trade-off. Sure, you won the, that lottery and then you got uh, Leon Dreisaitl. Good for you. You have incredible luck. Anyone would kill to be you. But then you have a responsibility to the sport of hockey – to do well by those guys. I don't care if you're a Calgary Flames fan. You still want to see those guys do well. Calgary Flames You make fans. good moves and you go in every single year. You are all in every single year that those players are on your team because, A, it shows those players that, yeah, you are who we're building around and we are going to try and get success every year. And it makes them want to stay. Whereas now they kind of just make terrible trades. Connor McDavid looks 50 years old. <laughs> that might have something to do with the location in which they play, but it's just like. He's got to be a heated driveway. It, yeah, that's all right then. He'll be all right. Circling back to the one point you made, if you were an Oilers fan, what do you hope for right now? Because 
What Edmonton should be doing is what Pittsburgh did. All in, every year, sell the farm, and Pittsburgh got three cups out of it. Like, it worked, and they would trade all their futures for pretty good players to play depth roles and support Crosby, Malkin, and Latang. Ken Holland can do that, though. He's shown to be adept in max. He no, has made really not in a really long goddamn time, though. Look, they were still getting- all his good trades in Detroit were when he started to sell the Tatar trade. Fantastic, yeah. Like, but it was the other way. Look at every uh, trade he made in a long time trying to. He is an exceptionally poor talent evaluator in today's NHL. The guys he gives contracts to. Um, the position they're in in their career when he does it, the players he does acquire when he does attempt to sell futures. So my conundrum as an Oilers fan will be, I would want this team to sell everything right now to be good now, but they've got arguably one of the worst gyms in the league to do that right now. Like they're going to sell the farm for Danny to Kaiser. <laughs> like, I think the people you keep are Ryan Nugent Hopkins, Yamamoto, Puli RV. Nuge is one of the most common players, like projected to be on the outs. I've seen trade rumors not, for Nuge not every since year. He signed the extension, though. Oh, I forgot about the extension. Actually, yeah. oh, I really actually forgot about that. Yeah, got to be someone on their roster that they can flip to somebody to light a fire under what they're whatever they're trying to do. McTavish. Whether that be <laughs> whether that be they just don't make the playoffs and they try and get a lottery pick again. Or they bring somebody in who's like fills out their top six, and they're like, "This is our depth." And the, then they just ride McDavid and, and Drysaddle until they're they f- collapse on the ice. Catch twenty two is the guys in their depth who have been at least the, the competent bums we've talking about are the young guys. It's been Tyler Benson and Ryan McLeod. <laughs> like, yeah, like they've got Kyle Turris, Devin Shore, I think bad, R- Brandon bad, Perlini. Bad. <laughs> Listen, we we thought we had a gem there. <laughs> well, maybe <laughs> that didn't work. It's, they still have Zach Cassian somehow. Bad. I I know this is like a batty episode. Like our brains are jumping all over the place. I'm just gonna close this by thinking I I genuinely believe right now, and I'm biased as all hell. I'm not even gonna try to be objective here. It is a better time to be a Red Wings fan than it is to be an Oilers fan. I it's couldn't deal with that. Frustrating being a Red Wings fan. Imagine the anxiety of losing a year of. McDavid's prime every year this happens without fail. Imagine how you'll feel when he leaves. <laughs> God. Because your team, your organization is a tire fire. Trade him in February when it's too cold for people to go out and riot and burn the city down. That's true. The fire won't even spark. No. No. I'm going to trade him in the middle of the Olympic gold medal game. <laughs> <laughs> All right. He'll play the best game of his life. <laughs> he'll smile for the first time. Okay, we're going to wrap up this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. Uh, thank you all for tuning in and for bearing with us. Uh, I know you saw a little bit of scrambled brain today, but yeah, sometimes we just let the podcast ride like that. A little bit of a, an inside view into the chaos of our minds. Um, thank you to all of our listeners, our name level sponsors, Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, uh, Kyle Karagitz, Nick Perks, Brett Bailey, Terry of the number 69, Crying Ryan, Hannah's Banana Slam, and Jamathong, Taylor Tadgel, Matthew M. Rice, B. Diz, Carl Brutana Nanaluski, Chimmy, Citizen High Five, CJ Sully, Craig Kibble, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Give Blood, Fight Probert, Greech, Hana Lee, Hassam al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Jake Kiefer, Justin and the Angry Mob, who won the pizza toss at the LCA. Oh, wow. I'm very jealous. I've never won one of those. I've won that's actually my life's goal is to win a pizza toss. We should put a good word in with Carly. Maybe she can cheat it for us. Uh Kaylin Wood, King Tone, Kyle Hashman, Matt McKay, RA, Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Stay Fresh Cheese Bags, Zach Spring, Zarly Zalapsky. Andrew Bohan, Sam Bankson, Adam, I wish I could finish like Ernie, Antonio Gracias, Babe Landeskog, Ben Barron, Connor Leitonen, Eric Sinkowski, Evans Tub Bubble, <laughs> Ev- Evans Bingo Card, James Laporte, Jeremy Brocker, John Evans, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Stan Olson, or sorry, Logan Stahl, Matt Keeler, Matt S., Max One Million Dollars, <laughs> Pippi Long Nippies, Revy DeLuca, <laughs> Slady Bartfast. What is that? I don't know. Terry Actual, Trevor Pebblevar, Zach Handyside, and Zach McCann, a driving range superstar. See you, weirdos, on Sunday. 
Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.